Hello, and welcome to another Industry Careers for PhDs podcast brought to you by Cheeky Scientist. I'm your host, Isaiah Henkel, and today we will be talking with Tom Dooley on industry and entrepreneurship. If you'd like to hear the full interview, go to CheekyScientist.com backslash association and learn how to become an associate. Uh, you'll also learn how to get access to our full job search blueprint for PhDs, as well as our private PhD job referral network. If you'd like our podcast delivered to you as they become available, as well as our free articles, just go to our homepage, CheekyScientist.com, and sign up with your name and email address at the bottom of that page. You can also listen to all of our other podcasts on iTunes. Uh, so once again, we will be talking with Tom Dooley today on the topic of industry and entrepreneurship. We will jump in and get started now. Uh, so we're really excited to have you here today, Tom Dooley. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Let's jump right in. Okay. Well, the, the first question I had to ask is, you know, it's pretty basic. You move, and it's it's kind of the core of what what cheeky scientist is a, is about, and it's what what I think, you know, uh, you can really help with. You know, you move from academia into industry roles, in, you know, everything from R and D, entrepreneurship, nonprofits, big pharma. Can you maybe elaborate a little on that and tell us? How one role led to another, and give us a you know a bit o an overview of your uh, you know the, the path that, that you took from okay. academia to the different industries. Well, probably the quickest way to summarize it is to uh, use the analogy of the ET movie. I just ate one Reese's pieces after the other. You know, I'd pick one up, and that one would lead to the next, and that would lead to the next. Um, and many, many times I refer to it as um, realizing my tendency towards ADD. So all I did was stick a saddle on the ADD horse and I rode it to completion. So um, there, there's an element of I, I like the venture of doing new things. And I think as a scientist, the creative aspect, the wanting to be the first to publish something, the wanting to be the first to discover something, the first person to ever sequence a DNA sequence of something. Um, that's a that's a motivator, and and it's one that's deeply ingrained within me. I, lo I love the newness of things, and to some extent, I like the newness of things more than I like managing the old. So, uh, as an as an overarching principle, innovation is what has driven me forward. Um, and in many contexts in science, and I'm sure, uh, Isaiah, you've, you've mentioned this many times to your listeners and in your, through your books about the need to focus. Yes, we do have to focus, but for some of us, we also need to understand and embrace our own identity. And my identity is I'm an ADD prone guy. I, I like the diverse challenges. And so, uh, this, the conventional wisdom that I heard from university professors, and I also heard this in industry, was it's better to be, um, you know, an, an inch wide and a mile deep than being, you know, the, the inverse of that. Um, but mm. that wasn't me. Um, there are a lot of scientists who are really comfortable devoting 30 years of their life to some individual protein or gene that's expressed in a mitochondrion. And that's it. I mean, that's what they do. They do it, you know, 60 hours a week, yep. day in, day out. And they're comfortable in that kinds of minutial detail about one particular thing. What I try to do is I do it in modules. I'm, I'm deep and I drill down, but I do it for a season and then I move on to another thing. So I think there's a, there's, uh, there's an element of, creativity that we can bring to the table through diversity. However, we have to show ourselves to be competent in any of those endeavors. And if we stop before we reach a level of competence in there, it doesn't matter. It, it's all a washout. So we really do need to spend a sufficient amount of time on whatever the topic is or the theme is of that moment in life and, and, and embrace it, embellish it, and become competent there. I have the opportunity also to mentor people. I have a number of, of younger professionals in my life, and they can be NFL athletes. So they could be people that I know in the nonprofit world uh, or just friends of the family that I, that I speak into their lives. And I often tell them, I said, if you want to influence influential people, there's a common set of key principles you have to have. 
And the key is you must first be competent in what you're talking about. And you need to marry it with a degree of confidence as you present it. So competence with confidence is a great thing. And so as, as I developed through my career, um, you know, I obviously started out in academia as a molecular biologist, uh, worked, you know, worked, rode that, you know, rode that hard. And then I was a postdoc at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London, um, working on really the early days of oncogenes and, um, you know, cancer, uh, cancer biology and absolutely loved it, had a great time. Uh, but I was then faced with an issue when I was coming back from the UK, coming back to the States. How do you get from a postdoc experience into either a university job, a uh, faculty position, an assistant professorship, or an entry level uh, scientist position in a big pharma company? And right. I'll tell you, it was, it was difficult. It was a difficult phase because I was overseas when I was doing it, so I was interviewing, flying back and forth to the States. But I also came back and, and what was presented to me, uh, frankly, was I had better opportunity in industry than I did uh, in, in entering a university position. But I interviewed for both. And probably in my impatience, if I had just waited a little longer, maybe waited another year, maybe waited two years longer through my postdoc years, uh, I probably could have landed immediately that academic post that I was, you know, desirous of. But I was offered positions at Eli Lilly and at the Upjohn Company. Um, and I decided wow. that the position at the Upjohn Company was the ideal fit for me, uh, because I, because of what they were wanting to do. And in those days, this is in the late 1980s, they were just launching the Rogaine minoxidil hair growth, uh, product. And so I got to be part of the Rogaine team of Upjohn. So it was a really cool opportunity to be on the leading edge of a new way of doing science and a new way of doing, doing commercial development in the pharmaceutical industry. Because for those of, uh, of your listeners who, who might be, you know, older, um, that was the juncture at which television advertising for pharmaceutical products was being launched, and, and Rogaine was the first product to do that. So mm. there was a lot of interest in how do you commercialize products with a direct-to-consumer driven market campaign. Now, today, we probably all detest that because we can't stand all those drug ads on TV. I certainly can't. I hate them. I, I just, you know, one after another, I'm tired of hearing all the things that it causes wrong. But... Um, but that's was that was the juncture. So I had well, both opportunities available. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it sounds like you've done a lot, and we just covered. So for you guys listening, we just covered a. a <laughs> speaking of breadth, we covered a huge, huge uh, number of steps here, and, and a lot of a lot of space. So I want to dig in and back up just a little bit, just to make sure that we, uh, we 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 kind of consolidate into some key takeaways. So the first thing that you said that I think is really relevant to you guys listening. Uh, for everyone listening, Tom, is that you redefined what success was for yourself. And you said the conventional wisdom was that digging deep into something for a lifetime was success. And a lot of you guys who are listening, that's what you, you know, you've been told and kind of trained by academia. And if you don't do that, if you don't, you know, like publications, that's a real easy practical example. If you don't get that publication, if you don't focus on one protein your whole life, you're not successful, but you get to choose success for yourself. You can redefine it at any time, just like Tom said, and you can drill into a variety of topics. You can do things, uh, you know, that wouldn't be successful in the eyes of someone else, but are successful to you. And you can kind of map out your career that way. And I think that's a great starting point. You really need to uh, create a vision for what you want and, and def you know, define success on your own terms. And then finally, you know, I, I really like the points you brought up too, Tom, about competence you know, with competence and, and becoming competent in something is important. So you're not just skipping around trying a bunch of things uh, without really digging in or learning them. So that's important too. Yeah, we might have ADD tendencies or we might like to skip around a little bit more. Many of you have, have mentioned that you can't stand being stuck in the same career path uh, and just working on, you know, a, a protein or the same project for, for 20 years. Uh, it's fine to jump around. And in industry, you'll do that much more. You know, you you can jump around every 
a year or two or three, and and that's okay. But you need to get to that level of competence first. So that's that's a good measure. I, I really like that, and that competence right. will give you confidence. And um, I, you know, I think there's a you know I, there's a there's a Hebrew proverb that says, "Do you see a man skilled in his labor? He'll stand before kings and not mere men." If you want to influence other people, if you want to be successful in your career, you must become competent in the thing that's in front of you now. Hmm. Just you may hate it. You may hate working on that mitochondrial protein, but suck it up. Suck it up for two or three years. Become good. Get something accomplished at that step rather than moving on from from task to task to task without accomplishment. The goal is accomplish something at each juncture. Right. No, I I completely agree. And and so. So you see what Tom's doing very skillfully here. He's telling you that you can redefine success for yourself, but he's at the same time making you uh, responsible uh, to get as much out of where you're at now, right? So if you might be stuck in academia currently, that doesn't mean that you just throw it out the window. It means that you get as much out of it as you can. You do, you do a good job. Um, but at the same time, you can make a change. You can transition into industry. And this is the path that, that Tom took. And so making that transition onto, to the topic that you started talking about, uh, at the end was that you see things changing. You went into industry because you wanted to do something different. Uh, you had a different vision of success. And then you, you started talking about some changes in industry, like, uh, you know, whether it's direct marketing, creating a product. And that's, that's kind of my next, that's my next line of question wants to focus on that. So, so kind of how has, how has your formal training in academia helped you with these roles, right? So you brought up two things that I'm particularly interested in, uh, for the people listening, you brought up creating a product and things like direct marketing, right? So the stuff that we don't, we're not trained about in academia. So how did your experience in academia help you prepare for these different roles? Uh, in large part, it doesn't. Um, that's uh, 80% of the answer is dismissive. There's a piece of it that is valuable. The skill sets that you learn as a competent scientist, as a competent uh, PhD or an engineer, you learn analysis, you learn writing skills. I find it remarkable. You know, my, my PhD mentor was a real hardcore tough guy. He's a, he was a great writer. His name is Barry Poliski. Um, and Barry Poliski is one of the gurus of RNA technology. I mean, and I, I had a great opportunity working with him. I remember when I first met with him, uh, early on in my graduate studies at, at Indiana University, I presented my first manuscript to him. And I'm a young guy in my 20s, and I write my first paper, which eventually won a bunch of awards. The stuff I was on was really cool stuff. But I, I write this paper, yeah. and I submit it to him. The first nine times he saw my paper, he redlined the whole thing, threw it back at me, and said, you are illiterate. You have to learn to write. And he mentored me in the skill of being a quality writer. So writing skill is something you can develop as a, as a, as a graduate student or as a postdoc mm-hmm. that will, it will inure great benefit to you in the days ahead because ultimately I think our success is directly a function of our ability to communicate. Can we communicate? Can we articulate what it is we've accomplished? Yes and the goals of where we're heading. So I think writing skills as a scientist enables you to move into other directions because you know how to, how to express logic paths and, and conclusions in a way that people who've had training in um, uh, marketing and advertising and, and business, they may not know it. Now, they have a certain set of communication skills, but they don't have that, the same uh, emphasis. So writing, I think, is, is a great thing that I took yes. from this and moved it into industry. So writing well, skill was key. Absolutely. And uh, I'm just pausing on that so you guys really take it in. Because we have talked about communication skills, whatever you want to call it, interpersonal skills, writing. And moving forward, this stuff is not going to become less and less important. It's going to become more and more important. Because yes. almost everything else can be outsourced or automated except for communication. Uh, you know, Whether it's person-to-person communication, writing communication. And so the, the best writers, the best communicators, they're the ones that get jobs. And, and it's not just – I also want to point out that it's not just being able to write with one style or for one type of audience. Like most of you have figured out at least at some level to be able to write for you know, a, a peer-reviewed journal, right, for the, audi- the reviewers you're writing for. But you have to be able to write for other types of audiences too, and which is why I'm really glad we have Tom on today because you, you can't just focus on your purpose. You've know, you got to focus on the audience, and those, those are really the two things to come together. Uh, so right. 
you know, whether you're writing an article for industry, whether you're writing an article uh, for an academic publication, there's going to be a huge difference right there. A lot of you guys are starting to create online profiles, right? So if you're writing, a, you're answering a thread on LinkedIn, you're, you're writing, uh, maybe have your, uh, your blog article where you have your CV posted now. A lot of people are doing that. There's going to be different styles and, and you're going to want to convey different things and you really need to uh, start, you know, nurturing that skill. Yes. Yes. So I would say that uh, in in as back to your original question, what did I take from from there? Uh, obviously, being a credible scientist was was valuable, but I think the communication skill to this day is the thing that was most valuable to me. Uh, I've even ventured off and I've you know I've published books that are non scientific books. I've written in you know, non fiction, non profit books that have absolutely nothing to do with science. But if you look back in history in the 1980s, what did my graduate student advisor say to me? He said, Dooley, you're illiterate. And he was right. You know, I was a Kansas farm boy. I was used to, you know, playing, playing on the farm with, you know, cows and stuff. <laughs> so for me to go from a, from a Kansas farm to becoming an accomplished molecular biologist, that was a significant, uh, you know, step up. And but I would have never gotten there if I hadn't mastered the ability to be an effective communicator. So I think communication is central to uh, career advancement. Um, yes, it's, it's central. You can't you can't get yes. past it. Now, differences. And I want to summarize for you. I like to use acronyms and abbreviations and stuff to kind of summarize. But um, what are the fundamental differences that I see between an academic setting and, a, and an industrial or a pharmaceutical setting, and I use yes. the, the three P's, three P's. On the, on the university academic side, the three P's I most recognized were publications, politics, and personality. All right? Publications, yes. you know, you got to write the papers, got to get them out the door. Politics, it was such a, it was like you had to be the big fish in a small pond. So there was constant fighting and bickering, and it was all about the cult of me in academia. It's all about me being the guy who's noticed. I'm the one with the promotions, and I'm the one with the papers. I'm the one with the grants, and I'm the one with the grad students. We've all seen that. There's a cult of me that operates around politics in um, uh, you know, politics and personality in academia. Now, to contrast that, when you get into the pharmaceutical industry or uh, medical devices or biotech, the three P's are very different. They're patents, products, and profits. So if you are if you're accustomed in academia to think of what's important, well, I've got to have papers. It's I've got to be able to fight politics well yes. to get off of space and students, and I've got to have a big cult of me personality. All right, none of that means a hill of beans in the pharmaceutical industry or the medical device industry or biotech or, for that matter, engineering. It, it just doesn't. It, it has no gravitas there. None. So when you walk over, you have this rude awakening that what are they really after? They're really after shareholder performance that quarter. They're concerned about what Wall Street says or what venture capitalists or angel investors say. They're interested in the dollar signs, the pound signs, the euro signs. That's what they're interested in. And to get there, they need to have patents so they have some proprietary angle and they need products or services to offer. So that paradigm shift is huge, and it's why many people in academia yeah. cannot comprehend it. They don't even get the. They don't even get why. Uh, this is the reason I, for the listeners today. The reason I'm actually on the call today was I encountered on LinkedIn, just ran across this article that I, I believe Isaiah wrote it. Um, and it was about why PhDs don't get it about getting jobs in the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And, and I read it and I went, this is spot on. This is absolutely the truth. If somebody's actually telling others what, you know, what's wrong with their paradigm. Your paradigm works. It works if, yes, if you can be fortunate enough to get the grants that are hard to get, get the academic position, which are hard to get. Uh, but for eight out of 10, that isn't going to be the glide path you're going to end up with. So for most people who are trained as scientists today, we've, we're just creating this glut environment of, of well, you know, well-trained people, 
and they're thinking, well, what can I do with this? Well, one thing you need to do is you need to ask the question, what skill sets do I have when I move to industry that can impact patentability, product development, and profitability? And if you can begin to shift your paradigm to money is not evil, money is an amoral force. Yes. It can yes. be used for good or bad. And there yes. are many academics who have this, this elitist attitude of, well, I wouldn't lower myself to work for profitability. <laughs> I wouldn't work. I wouldn't sell out to the man. Well, get over it. If, if, you know, if you can't buy macaroni, who cares what you think? Who cares what your opinion is? You've got to be able to pay your bills. And, and paying your bills in the pharmaceutical sector or, you know, any, any life science company, that, that's the industry that I know. Uh, there's, it's, it's an amoral thing. It's not, it's not immoral to sell out to the ban. So, uh, but you'll hear that, you'll hear that chatter a lot in academia that it's a sellout. I do think it's changed a bit over time when, when I entered into this, uh, you know, Genentech was the first big biotech success and it was just starting to ramp up in the late 1980s. Uh, so there really wasn't even a biotech industry to speak of. You know, there was BioRad and some of the kit supply companies and things that, that, you know, made, you know, biochemicals and, uh, th those kinds of materials. But, but the whole industry hadn't even happened yet. So I think it's been, uh, demythed some, um, since that time, but, uh, you know, you got to pay the bills and you got to find a, a career path that uses, uses your skill sets. The last thing that I heard was you, you talking about, you know, the paradigm shift. And I think you pointed out a, a bunch of really important things. And so I want to go back and dig into them. Um, so you talked about the, the three P that's the first thing I wanted to touch. And I really, I'm, I really like, uh, how that really summed up the importance of academia versus industry. So my question is, and it might be more of a tougher question. So you mentioned that personality is important in academia, but it's not in industry. But at the same time, you mentioned that communication is crucial in industry. So maybe you can help us differentiate just in the terms of semantics there, what you mean by personality being imp not being important uh, in industry, but communication okay. being important. Well, if uh, in on the industrial side, it's much more important that the product or the service tasks are fulfilled than it is that an individual gets the credit and the kudos and the um so there's there's much more an orientation on the task at hand what is it we're trying to accomplish this yes. month this quarter in industry and you will often find in industry and maybe it's a bit frustrating but you'll have something that i call the vp of the month thing going on you know whoever the whoever the new VP was that just got hired in that region comes in and does some kind of executive, you know, fiat order and says, we're now moving in this direction and you have to be adaptable and you have to go, okay, it's no longer about me. I'm the guy who's interested in mitochondrial proteins. And you will immediately find it isn't about you. It's really about the task. And that's being defined very often. Yes. It's being very defined at the high end of the company. It's being, you know, somebody in some E level, C level role of the company, uh, said for the next quarter, we got to produce this product or service. And so the goal is how quickly can you adapt? I remember as a young scientist, when I went to the Upjohn company, I went in there to work on Rogaine. I worked on, was working on dermatology. I worked on topical skin lighteners, had some, some pretty cool projects I was doing. And I had a small lab, small lab group. I loved it. A year and a half after I got there, they brought in a new, um, you know, corporate level, you know, executive guy who came in and said, eh, uh, we're not interested in that dermatology stuff anymore. Uh, we're going to disband the department. Yes. And I had just got hired into that department. And I, and I mean, we had, we had the best dermatology research department, bar none, in the whole world. And they shut it down. I went, this is boneheaded. This is stupid. But instead of going kicking and screaming, mm. I said, hey, I also know cancer research. Why don't you move me to the cancer research department? And so a month later, I'm doing cancer research, and I hit the ground running there and published papers there and did technical reports for the company there and helped advance some of those programs. So you have to be adaptable in, in industry. Um, so the idea of being uh, intently focused in industry, it's true. You have to be, but boy, does the target keep moving. The target is constantly moving. Yes. It's yes. your focus, yeah. but the target's shifting. 
<laughs> no, no, I, and I, I like what you brought up, and uh, I think a couple of key points are you guys for, for you guys listening. You know, when first of all, when you're in industry, yes, people will tell you that your research is going to change, right? It, 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 they'll tell you that the work's going to change, and that might come from the top down. Uh, and it, it, it's, it happens a bit differently than it does in academia, but it's not like it's any different in academia. You're applying for grants for things that are going to get funded. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. You, you have to follow the money. In this, in this sense, you're, it's driven by what products are selling or where the profit is, you know, one of those P's that Tom talked about. Uh, but another point is that Tom didn't just get angry and complain about it, right? He took initiative uh, and and realized that he had the skills he needed to learn about any other department and he asked to be put in another department, right? So initiative, mm -hmm. I would say, is crucially important. You know, we've we, we brought that up over and over again. Um, so just just to kind of go step to the side here a little bit because we everybody's listening, you know, for the most part, they don't have a job in the industry yet. They, they're looking for that, you know, their eyes are set right in front of them on that, that transition point, right? Just getting their foot in the door, things like networking, getting that interview, yep. getting the referral, these kind of things. And, and kind of on that note, I wanted to ask you, given all of your experience at all the different companies and types of industries you work with, what, what are usually the entry level positions for PhDs and postdocs and advanced postdocs, you know, that you see? Where, where are they coming in at now? Okay. Um, the, the field has, I guess the, the take home lesson up front is it's gotten very difficult to get entry level positions, even in the pharmaceutical industry. I think there's, there's a sense of, um, well, it's tough getting grants and becoming an assistant professor. Well, it's also tough to get a good job in a Pfizer. It's tough. It's, it's hard. There's a lot of competition. Um, and you want to position yourself, uh, just as excellently as you would if you were wanting to get a position in, in academia. You yeah. have to, you have to be able to communicate and articulate. I would add to that. One of the things that, that I did, even as a grad student, was I would go to meetings, I'd go to scientific conferences, whether it's a state-level meeting, a national-level meeting, I would go there and I would look for opportunities to find people from industry to go have dinner with them. And frankly, when you're young and you don't have a lot of money, people in drug companies will take you to dinner. Just go, just say, hey, I, you know, I'm, yes. I'm just curious, what's it like working for Pfizer or Baker or, you know, whoever? And and say, hey, you know, could I could I join you for a meal? I just want to pick your brain. And those folks help bridge you, bridge the chasm. So create relationships very proactively. Seek them out. Find people. I remember I sought out opportunities to meet people from CELTAC in London. I met people from Beringer Ingelheim in Germany. I sought out people from Eli Lilly in Indianapolis. I sought them out as a graduate student yes. at, at co regional conferences or national conferences, and I said, hey, could, could we sit down? Would you please help me and, and, and give me some counsel? And I'll tell you what, I literally got a job offer at Eli Lilly as a result of having done that. Yes. No, as a I grad student, no, proactively. I, I love, yes. I, I and it's, you, for those of you that – you know, I've talked about my story and several other people's story. That's how it happens. When I was a grad student, I went to a conference and sought out companies and got a job over a burrito. Uh, you know, and mm -hmm. Tom did the same thing. And you, there's no real magic behind it. It's just actively putting yourself out there, taking that initiative, right? You brought up that before. Mm -hmm. Taking that initiative and, and having no kind of limiting beliefs about – who you are, you know, it doesn't matter. You should leverage your position, especially if you're a student or even a postdoc. It's, it's really the same thing. Leverage that position. Thank you for joining us for another Industry Careers for PhDs podcast. If you're interested in attending one of these interviews live, or if you're interested in getting access to the full interview, including all of the background materials and show notes, Go to cheekyscientist.com backslash association and learn how to become a associate. Uh, you can get on the wait list for the next association enrollment period there and learn full details about the program. It's a program specifically designed to help PhDs transition uh, into top industry positions. If you would like to see receive more of these interview highlights uh, via our podcast, uh, sent directly to your email, go to cheekyscientist.com and email subscribe under where it says start here. Uh, 
If you haven't already, you can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. Um, Until next week, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional.